we just thank you the, for the opportunities that we have to come together to study your word. Just be with Kevin as he presents a lesson to us today, and may we be encouraged to continue our, our walk in, uh, with you. It's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. Linda says she brought eggs for everybody just in case you need to throw a few at me. <laughs> Where are they? <laughs> you set that up, didn't you? Yeah. All right. Let's see if we've got everything kind of lined out here. Now, Beck and I are back in town for the weekend here. Uh, for the SIBI graduation, we got to be a part of all the different ceremonies and things, which is a lot of fun. And the, the, uh, the banquet particularly, um, they were brutal. <laughs> they, they, they got after me on a couple of different occasions on there when we had the faculty roast. I, I got roasted pretty good. It's like, huh? I need to put some sunblock on or something there. They were, they were getting after me. No, but it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun with the... The graduates and their family and getting the chance to get to meet them and get to visit with them that's always a blessing to have that opportunity and of course get to come back and get to see y'all um, that's that's just a special thing for for both of us we hope you know how much we love you how much we enjoy getting to be with you and and the privilege of teaching is always uh, a lot of fun i'm getting a chance to do some preaching around the area there in central texas there at Southside and Colleen, they're looking for a minister right now, so I'm getting to sub in there once in a while. And a little place called Lake Victor that's just real close there, I'm, I'm getting to preach there some as well. So just a, a, a lot of fun to get to do that. Um, chance to do a few things there in Lampasas where I ministered for 13 years. So that's always a lot of fun to get to get to be with people that, that I've known for a long time. And, um, and on top of that, I get to be with Becca, so... Yeah. All right. Just wanted to say thanks to Richard and the rest of them to, you know, for the opportunity to get to be here. That's that's always a, a just a lot of fun too. This particular section of scripture, you guys have been reading through and studying through 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus and Titus is very different than Timothy. Uh, even the feel of Titus is different than Timothy. Um, there are some strong words that Paul will give to Timothy, but there are some even stronger words that he would give to Titus. Uh, they're not in the same place. Timothy is in Ephesus, Titus in, is in Crete, and they're about as different as daylight and dark when it comes to just uh, the kind of people that they are. We'll, we'll notice that a little bit more as we read some of the scriptures here. But Titus is in kind of a difficult place. Timothy is in a, in, in a little bit of a difficult place, not because Ephesus, uh, Ephesus has its problems, okay? If you've read through Ephesians, you know anything of the background, you know that, that idolatry is everywhere. The problem in Crete isn't so much the idolatry, it is there, but they are, how do we say this nicely? They're horrible people. They, they really are. They're, I mean, he... Even their own people talk about how bad the Cretans are. Uh, and they still use that phrase to talk about bad folks. Well, they're just a bunch of Cretans. Well, how does that last for a couple of thousand years unless they really are, right, a bunch of bad people? And so for Paul to, to really emphasize some things to them, to really begin to talk to them about how they're supposed to live, it really, I know that we're talking about the secret life here, but there really isn't a secret to living the Christian life. What it is, is it's difficult. And if you're going to live in a society, we kind of know this, don't we? If you're going to live in a society that's not a real good society for Christianity, and that's become us, hasn't it? And that kind of where we are now? It is not kind to Christianity. If that's the case, if that's what's going on, then the further it gets from God, the more difficult it becomes for Christians to live that life. And that's exactly what Paul is going to, to emphasize to Titus in this particular section of Scripture we're going to be looking at. And it's kind of a long section, 
uh, chapter 2, verse 11 through uh, chapter 3. There's a lot here. There's a lot being mentioned. Uh, and, and so we were, but, but I really want you to, I really want you to think about what's going on. Verse, verses 11 and 12, um, when he talks about this grace that has been given to us, it's appeared bringing salvation to all men. It teaches us to say no to all kinds of bad stuff, to live self-controlled lives, to say no to ungodliness and worldly desires. It teaches us how to live now in a society that is not friendly towards us. Again, it's not a secret, but it is difficult, okay? And so as we get into this, particularly when he says in this present age, he's talking about 2,000 years ago, but that could be said about us today as well, couldn't it? He's, he's teaching us how to say no to some things, how to say yes to some other things, but how to live that godly life in our present day, okay? So he is, he is helping us. It is teaching us. It's trying to help us understand some things that we may not know otherwise. All right, let's start with this, and let's see how we do on this, okay? So how did your parents try to motivate you to be good as a child? Where are you, Tom? See, I, I mean, I miss Tom so much because I haven't had anybody to pick on here in the last little while. How did your mom particularly motivate you, Tom? The Board of Education to the Seat of Learning? Regularly? Yeah, yeah. Anybody else like Tom grow up in that household? Yeah, I see a few hands going up. So. Uh, well, my mom never said, wait till your daddy gets home. She took care of the problem herself. And she was only about this tall. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. Now, my dad, he never needed to use a belt or a board. His hand covered the area quite nicely. He had big hands, and he knew how to use those to, to get my attention. Okay, um, I've mentioned to Becca before when I was little, I had a burr haircut. So, you know, I had a double calic and a double crown and they weren't messing with that. So it was five trips. So they would ask me what color hair I had, you know, when I first started going to school in first grade. And I said flesh tone because I didn't have enough hair to know. <laughs> I didn't know what color it was. No, but but what were some of the different just just call out from where you are, what are some of the different methods your parents used to try to motivate you toward good behavior? Oh, anybody else have that look? Is it mom's look more than it is dad's look? The eye of mom. It's like... Okay, good. The, the, the eye of mom. Somebody else? Oh, <laughs> confession's good for the soul, I've heard, yeah. And I think that my coworkers used to help me with because they had business and they didn't have a family like that. Would they call you in? Oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's funny. So there is the, the, the Board of Education sometimes, the, the eye or the look. Sent to your room, yeah. Oh, okay. All right, yeah. Carolyn? Oh, okay. Just having, just living a good example in front of you. That's good. What else? Okay, the way, that, the way that they raised you was pretty specific right here. Any training involved in that and teaching you how to do that? And here's how you speak to adults. And Yes, yes. Okay, good. Delayed punishment. Is there anything worse? Is there anything worse than delayed punishment? My mom, I, I remember specifically uh, a situation where my mom and dad had told my older brother and I, and it was always my older brother, he was always getting me into trouble. He's seven years older now, and I'm the one who got in trouble all the time. But Tim and I were, had been playing, we didn't have Nerf basketball back then, we had an oatmeal carton that we'd cut, you know, with a tennis ball. So we were playing in the house, because it was cold, it was wintertime outside, and they said, don't play ball in the house while we're gone. So what do you do as soon as they go out the door? <laughs> Clock fell. 
onto the floor, about 100 million pieces, you know, all over the place right here. And that was right after they left, and they were gone for two and a half hours. Isn't that a horrible feeling right there? You know in two and a half hours you're in trouble, right? And so you can't eat, you know. You only got two hands, and you're wringing both of those. It's just a horrible, kind of horrible feeling to go through all of that. There are a lot of different ways. You may think of some different things, and you may be thinking of other things. But one of the most popular, why do I have to do this? And normally, if it's a child involved, not, that's not always children. Some of us adults are pretty good at asking, but why? Right? You have to whine as you say that, right? Don't you? Why do I have to do that? Are they asking for more information? What are they asking for? Yeah, I want to go ahead and do it anyway, don't I? Regardless of the reason, regardless of anything else that you're going to talk about right here, I just want to do what I want to do. Uh, Becca and I were eating at Olive Garden yesterday afternoon. There was a little boy, uh, I was going to say sitting there. Most of the time he was standing there in his chair. And, you know, a little little thing like what we've got over here but uh, you know he's standing up in his chair and there were a couple of times he was very vocal he knew what he wanted he had breadsticks and he was dipping that in the sauce and his daddy took his breadstick away to wipe his hands and you'd have thought he had murdered the kid I mean everybody in the whole place heard him and dad had to take him out for a little while and 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 just help but how many times oh I got to show you a couple of others here that I found I don't know if you can see the one that's up here. <laughs> Drop the phone because I said so, that's why. Signed, Mom. <laughs> we would want that sometimes anyway, wouldn't we? Or this one here. I like the little boy here who's actually looking more like some kind of mafia don right there because I said so, that's why. Right? My mom was a pretty good motivator. Dad was even better in some things like that. But... The question really comes out of all of this is if we're going to talk about living grace and we're going to talk about learning how to say no to ourselves, how satisfying is that answer just because I said so? Think back. I know for some of you this is a long time. Think back of when you were teenagers. Tom, can you remember that far back? Probably not. But, but, but Thelma might help you. Yeah, who are you again? Do we, did we ever really respond well to that phrase, do it because I said so? Was that ever a good motivation? Like, we'd dig our heels in even more, wouldn't we? And then beyond that, it's not just the thing about children and just that kind of thing. What about when we became adults? Your boss tells you, you do this because I said so. Oh, that was great motivation, wasn't it? If you don't do this, you won't get paid. You won't get a paycheck. They, for whatever reason that they would use that kind of phrase, because I said so, that was a great motivation. Yes? No, not so much. Not so much. Well, part of the thing that we're going to learn in this particular study day, at least what we hope to learn, is the whys about all that. Paul talked about these Cretans, and I've already mentioned that. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, right? So why would Paul use that particular phrase to Titus about this group of people on the island of Crete? What, why do you think he would say that? Why do you think he would include that in his letter? Okay, this is not going to be an easy job, Linda said. Why else do you think he might use this phrase to talk specifically in the letter? It is a quote, right? One of your own poets, one of your own writers has said this. So is this Paul's view of the Cretans? I'm not sure it is, but you are going to have to deal with some of those folks, aren't you? In fact, as you read through the letter, these groups right here are almost all addressed. Isn't that interesting? 
So it's not just I'm going to give you a quote right here and not have anything to do with it. If I'm going to talk about it, these guys right here are some of the folks you're going to have to deal with, Titus. Some of these guys are going to be around the people you're trying to deal with, you're trying to work with as Christians. Do you think it's going to be easy for those people who live in households with liars to be truthful? When that's basically been the way that they've lived their lives most of their life. Or evil beasts. Just animal instincts. Or even those lazy gluttons. Do you think it's going to be easy to tell yourself no when all you've ever done is tell yourself yes and live that kind of life? So when we look at this, I think there are several things. Paul told Titus to make sure that he put some things in order when he left. And then he talks about elders and he talks about some other things. But there are some things that are in disarray in Crete. There are some things in the church that are not lined up and they're not in order. And Paul says, you've got some work to do and it's not going to be easy work to do. There are some things that are going to be difficult. But if you're going to put it in order, not everybody's going to enjoy order. They've had their own sense of what they wanted to do and the things that they, that they like to do. So Paul's going to tell them not just to do this, do it because I said so. He's going to talk more about the whys and the hows of all of that. And that is in direct contrast to how they found normal living conditions on the island of Crete. Okay? It's not going to be fun. It's going to be challenging. It's going to go against how they normally lived. And so with all of that taking place, I think there are some things that we need to go back and we need to think about as we look at all of that okay so let's why should i live and that's that's a really good question isn't it why should i live and act differently from the people that are around me and what am i supposed to learn how am i going to learn to live that kind of life there's not that many examples in front of me okay so let's do some reading together we're going to start in chapter 2 and verse 11 and going to read through then verse 15 of chapter 3 got your bibles Okay, starting in chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly. Now, you're going to hear that word sensibly about four times here in this section. I, anytime you see a repeated word, that's an emphasis, right? Which tells you something about life in Crete. Sensibility is not something they know very much about. But he says... The grace is going to teach us how to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify him for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort, reprove with all authority, let no one disregard you. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be un uh, uncontentious. I was going to say unconscious. That, that's what we are in here. No, no, don't be unconscious. To be uncontentious, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God may be careful to engage in good deeds. That's already the third time he's mentioned good deeds. That's another emphasis here. These things are good and profitable for men, but shun foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing 
that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Diligently help Zenos the lawyer, Apollos on their way, so that nothing is lacking for them. And let our people also learn to engage in good deeds. Number four, to meet pressing needs that they not, may not be unfruitful. Again, that's another theme here. All who are with me, greet you, greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Now, a couple of things that we want to talk about as we contrast some of the teachings that Paul will give with some of the things that they have been taught most of their life. If we're going to talk about the Cretans here, here are some things that are going on with them. In Titus chapter 1, back in verse 14, it mentions that there are those, he tells Titus, don't be paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. Okay? These human commands, most of the time, and most of the commentators believe that we're talking about a Jewish sect of men who are going around teaching that whatever they say is more important than what God says. I've got some rules for you, Harry, I think you need to do. Yeah, but who am I to be able to tell Harry how to live his life unless it comes from Scripture? Now, the only thing that they could point to was going all the way back to the law of Moses. But what did Paul already told everybody about the law of Moses? What happened to the law of Moses when Jesus went to the cross? It was abolished. It was nailed to the cross, actually, is the word picture, isn't it? And if that's the case, then, then when we look at the law of Moses, and we're still trying to push that and, and place that on somebody to live that way, what do we understand from Paul? What's Paul going to say? We don't live under the law of Moses anymore. Yes, we are to live a godly and a good life right here, but not according to the rules of the law. Okay? Are there other, are there other rules, are there other things that we have been given that we are to live by? This is where you nod your head. Yeah, right? Yeah. Of course there are. There are Christian rules and Christian principles given to us as well. But the com human commands, and he actually contrasts that with truth. Just because somebody else, somebody who is older might come and tell you, you know, you need to live like this, you need to do this. I'm sure that never happens to any of us, that people come along and tap us on the shoulder and say, you know, if you just did this, everything would be better. Right? That happened? Sure. If you just live like that, if you just would apply this, if you would just do these things and everything would be better. Human commands, and Paul says, leave that alone. Leave that alone. They also claim relationship with God. They claim to know God, but their behavior betrays their claim. What's their behavior saying? God who? In fact, you will remember over and over, Jesus would talk to, about the Pharisees. Not only would they not listen to God, they actually made themselves God. Remember that there was the time when you have the Pharisee and the publican, and it actually says he was praying, some versions say in himself, some versions says he was praying to himself. If he's praying to himself, then who is God in his mind? He is, right? And so you can get to a point in time where you become your own God. I decide what I'm going to do. I decide what's right. I decide what's good. And I don't have to listen to anybody else. They claim to know God, but their behavior looks just the opposite of what God looks like. Okay? Self-discipline? What is that? Foolish controversies and genealogies. They're caught up in these. And they love to debate. They love to argue over some of the littlest bitty things right here. And he's saying, as far as life is concerned, they're not living any of those things. The things that are very plain, the things that are very clear, they push those to the side and they'd rather, they'd rather argue over the minutiae. Does that sound like some folks even in religious circles today that would rather talk about all the other kinds of things when the, the most plain things are right in front of everybody, but they don't live according to that. 
and they're full of deception and dishonesty. Okay? Deception and dishonesty. So the why and the how are talked about in these areas. Now, if we were to ask Paul, hey, Paul, what do you think about the teaching of these Cretans right here? Tell me about how, how you see them. And he would say, kind of up front, I don't think real highly of their teaching. Okay? In fact, he would say in chapter 3 and verse 5, you know your deeds of righteousness aren't all that righteous. The things that you think will make you righteous in front of everybody else really aren't that. They don't look like God at all. In fact, you remember, the lawyer comes to Jesus and he says, good teacher, what thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus turns it around right there, and he doesn't give him a list of all those things. He, he, he challenges his idea of goodness. There's only one who's good. And so if we're going to talk about righteousness, we've got to have a standard that's different than the standard of the world. Yes? What? God is good, and anything he gives us, then we know that's going to be good for us. Okay? Your righteousness can't save. The false teachers are telling everybody, if you obey my commands, then you're in good shape. And Paul's saying, no, the only one who is good is God, and he's always going to give you something that's good for you. Yes, brother? Being called being self-righteous. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's called being self-righteous rather than a righteousness from God. On top of that, he says, your genealogies really don't have very much value in verse 9 of chapter 3. Have you heard people talk about that in, in front of you? My daddy was a preacher. Okay, or my daddy was an elder. Okay, you probably ought to live a little bit better than, you know, no, we don't say that. because There's something about me that wants to say that, right? It's like, okay, if, if, if you have this legacy left in front of you, why are you acting more like the world than you are your father? The genealogy that really matters is not who your daddy is, it's who your father is. It's who your brother is. I always talk about Tim being my older brother. He is. He is so much older than I am. He's 70 years old now. He had his birthday here a couple of weeks ago. He was my older brother. He was not always the best example for a younger Kevin, who's always trying to follow after big brother. But let me tell you something really important. My older brother, who's never led me astray, who's never put me in a situation that was iffy. Is our Lord Jesus, isn't it? And isn't that true for you too? So when we're talking about genealogies, let's throw all that out. Paul could do that, couldn't he? In fact, in Philippians, he said, you know, man, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I know exactly where my genealogy, genealogy is. I know who my dad was. I know, you know, generations of these folks. But let me tell you what really matters. Let me tell you about who my dad is. My heavenly father. Let me tell you about my older brother. There is no argument there then, is there? And that's the eternal relationship that matters most. And he says your lives are causing division there in verse 9. In fact, they are useless, of no value. Some of the versions say they are of no profit, which is an accounting term. In other words... If, you're, if you've got the books lined up here, everything in the black right here, he says they are of no value. That's all been erased. Everything that was in your account for good, that's all gone. So what are you going to claim for goodness of your own then? Everything you thought was good has been wiped off, of the, uh, off, of the, account, off the account, off the slate. The only thing you have to claim for good then is not your work, but his work what he has done for you, and what he continues to do in you. Paul's got some great things to be able to say here for these guys. Okay, Your righteousness can't save. Your genealogy is of no value. Your lives are causing lots of division. Now, 
The question really was, is so how is, is Titus supposed to deal with the divisive person? Because a lot of division, I, I, think, I think Paul is telling Titus there are some things you can put up with and there are a lot of things you can't put up with and this divisive person is not something you can be okay with. So how are you going to deal with this? What are you going to deal with this? You know, how are you going to talk to this person who is divisive? The first thing he says is you've got to know some things about this guy. And one of the things you're going to know really quickly from Scripture right here is that he is perverted. Some versions say he's warped or corrupted. He's twisted. He's a deviant. Now, none of those terms are terms we want to even think about, right? Because we think about all kinds of sexual perversion and all kinds of twisted and corrupt and bad-minded folks that do all kinds of horrible things. He says that's what these folks do. They don't do it necessarily. I'm, I'm sure that there were probably plenty of those folks in Crete that did, but he's talking about in a spiritual way. What do they pervert? The Word of God. Word of God. They pervert truth, don't they? It's and, and, and can you pervert it in such a way where there's a little bit of truth involved right here, but you throw a little bit of human tradition in there with it or a little bit of human teaching in with it, and all of a sudden it sounds good, but it's not God's truth. You can take one scripture out of the book and twist that thing, but if you go and you look at four or five or six different scriptures that say the same thing, then you know kind of what it is. Well, and, and we say it around here. You'll hear us say it from time to time. Um, the psalmist would say, the sum of thy word is truth, not some of your word is truth. And isn't that the case? It is, it is the collection of all of it. We've got to look at Scripture as a whole right here, not just a verse, because, yeah, those things can be twisted. Think about a life there on Crete where, where Paul is teaching Titus and Titus is trying to teach them to live self-controlled lives. So what does self-control look like? It is this very idea that we're going to get to right here in talking about saying no. And saying no to yourself is always easy, isn't it? No. Saying no to yourself is really difficult, isn't it? Because I want to. I have desires for this. I like this. I, you know, ice cream grabs a hold of me sometimes and won't let me go. Right? <laughs> Snickers. And there may be all kinds of things that we might need to confess in here, but okay, okay. That, that might be the rest of the class time. But there are, but there are, no, it's, it's the new thing they're, they're teaching, you know, the, the, Dr. Pepper float ice cream now from Bluebell. He's like, oh, my goodness. No. Okay, leave it alone, Kevin. Go on, go on, go on. Aren't there some things, though, that we can take that are very, very good? And isn't that, think about that for a moment. If we're twisting or corrupting or perverting, isn't that exactly what Satan did in the garden? What did he do with Eve? Did he know what God had said? Did God really tell you that you can't eat of this tree in the middle of the garden? He doesn't really mean that. What he really means is you actually can. And that appeals to her eyes. It appeals to her desires. It appeals to her wants. And that's all it takes. And you can take one word, you can take one phrase, you can take certain things away and move that around to where it ends up being just the opposite of what you're, what you're told. He says in chapter 3 and verse 10, warn them once, warn them twice. In fact, the, uh, the idea of warning right there, some of the versions actually uses that word admonish. Those are words, Okay. We're not talking about shunning them yet, but that's coming if they don't change. That's the kind of warning that's there. The admonishing has to do with speaking words. In fact, all the way through Titus, Paul's going to really emphasize that. Titus, you have to speak up. And almost every time that I hear that, I'm thinking about where we are in a society right now where we're being hushed. Is that not true? 
Well, it's not even just the judgment, but it's, it has more to do with don't you even say anything about the lifestyle I'm living. You have no right to tell me about how to live. You go live your life, I'll do what I want to do. I'm just fine, you're just fine, we're all fine, God's good with it. So don't you say anything. Paul is saying very specifically to Titus, you've got to speak up, brother. You've got to say what's wrong. You've got to speak very plainly to these folks, otherwise they're not going to hear it. You know the Cretans aren't going to say anything about them. You know the false teachers aren't going to warn against them. If you don't speak up, where are they going to get truth? Is that still true today for us? Is that still true in our families? Do we need to speak up? Is it still true in our congregations? That we have to speak up. I think there are a lot of things that God still is impressing upon us through Paul, through Titus, and through this church there on Crete. And so, finally, he says, avoid them, reject them, shun them, have nothing more to do with them. Okay? They do nothing good for you. There are some things that you're to know. There are some things that you are to do. There are some things that you are to be. But you need to make sure that you understand that you have to warn them and that you have to reject them after a certain point in time. And isn't that, yeah, Richard? Yeah, and I think sometimes we, we tend to think about it just being personality conflicts. And that's not what's going on at all here, is it? What's going on here is if you don't speak up for God in this right here, you're not going to have a body of Christ very long. What it's going to do is it's going to meld right back in to the culture that surrounds it, and the church is going to be just nothing more than another group involved in the culture. Okay? We must be different than the world around us. We're called to be salt and light. Didn't Jesus say that? Not just called to be, he says you are. You're supposed to be salt. You're supposed to be different than the world around you. The world around you is rotting and decaying, and if you don't apply the salt, it will be lost. You are to be light in a world of nothing but darkness. If you read through Titus, that, that's, pretty that's pretty clear. That sounds like Crete, doesn't it? And here is Titus being this light, and he's saying, you need to encourage everybody else to make sure they pull that bushel basket off of their light. That's more than a children's song, isn't it, guys? Isn't it? In fact, it wasn't written for children at all. It was written for adults, because adults have the same problem kids have, maybe even more so in trying to hide our own light. We can't be camouflaged Christians. The world is waiting. The world around us needs us to be something more than that. Unleavened in the midst of a very leavened group. So, let's talk about the opposite of that. We've talked about the, the Cretan teaching, the Christian teaching, and he's going to talk specifically about grace. That word grace Charis in the, in, in, in the Greek is something that causes joy. It's something that causes pleasure. It's something that causes uh, delight. It is something that you're, you're wishing for health and well-being. But we're not talking about just in the physical realm. We're talking about the spiritual realm. It is spiritual well-being. It is spiritual health. It is being what God wants you to be and so enjoying life from that sense. And Paul's going to say, grace is one of God's best instructors. I like that thought, don't you? We just got through graduating, uh, you know, this, this 90, 
Second, thank you. I, I thought that was right. 92nd class here at SIBI. And there's always a lot of fun that we have at the banquet, and they start talking and giving out gifts for some of their best instructors. I had the best excuse, though, didn't I? Right? Yeah. Um, they, they, they did all kinds of fun stuff and crazy stuff with all of that, with their instructors right here. But everybody's got different ones. We did when we were, when we were students here as well. There were certain instructors that we just clicked with. Well, one of the instructors that God says is one of the best teachers this church in Crete is ever going to have is going to be Grace. Now, if you go back to way, the way that Paul talks about it, there were those who were misusing Grace. Remember over in Romans? Are we going to continue in Grace so that sin might increase and abound? And he says, may it never be. We're not going to misuse Grace, but we do need Grace, do we not? And grace will teach us some things that simple rule-keeping will not. Grace will teach us how to live this good life. He says grace is going to teach us to say no to ungodliness. Okay? Again, we've already talked about how difficult that is in saying no. But ungodliness doesn't show up with a neon sign going, ungodliness, ungodliness, ungodliness. In fact, most of the time the world's pretty good at hiding that in such a way that you don't know that it really is ungodly until sometimes you're in the midst of it. Hasn't that always been the case? Did Satan, when he tempted Eve in the garden, did he show her this old yucky piece of fruit that already had worms crawling all over it and in it and everything? Is that what he did? No, it was a piece of fruit that looked good to the eyes. Ooh, that looks yummy. That looks like that's, that's exactly what I've been looking for. It's the best piece of fruit in the whole garden. And if she had only been able to see what was really there. But that's the way Satan works, isn't it? We've talked about wolves in sheep's clothing. Do they look like wolves when they're even among us? Most of the time, it sound, they sound pretty good. They look a little bit like us, kind of, sort of, in a strange way. But they're not healthy. They're not helpful in any of this. Saying no to ungodliness and saying no to worldly desires. Let's talk about it for just a moment right here. Are there God-given desires? Yes. Yes. But when the world gets a hold of God-given desires, again, it becomes perverted, doesn't it? It becomes twisted. It becomes all the things that God didn't want for it to be, and it ends up hurting us. And Paul's telling Titus, let him know. Let him know. This is, not going to be, this is not going to end well, as we say. And learn how to say yes to Jesus and learn how to say yes to your hope. Is it going to be hard? Probably. I don't know if you've ever thought about some of the most good, some, some of the best instructors you've ever had. We talked about Grace being a good instructor. Some of the best instructors you've ever had. Usually when people talk about that, we'll talk about some of the ones who demanded the most of them. Right? They made me work harder. They made me enjoy the class and maybe enjoy the teaching right here, but they expected a lot from me. And doesn't grace expect a lot from us? When Paul will talk about that in Romans chapter 5 particularly, he will say, Grace doesn't give us license to go and do anything and everything we want to do. Grace actually helps us do the things we're supposed to do and actually helps us have the desire inside to do exactly that. Grace is a great teacher. Well, Kevin, so you're talking about that. So what does grace teach? Okay. Chapter 2, verse 2. Paul talks about some things that grace will teach the older men. Now, I'm looking around the room. That's most of us, right? Guys? Okay, all right, turn your hearing, baby, hearing aids back up, okay? Okay, that's us. That's us, right? Are there some things that we're supposed to learn when we hear the teaching of grace? 
Yeah, oh yeah. In fact, he uses some things out of there in chapter 2 and verse 2. He says we need to live a temperate life. Some versions will actually talk about self-control in that realm. It is, it is a decent kind of life. I'm not, I'm not controlled by my emotions. Might, might be one of those things that when I was younger, I might have been more controlled by my emotions. Might have been the one that flew off the handle. Might have been one that was, that was controlled by my anger and had lots of issues there. To be dignified you ever seen somebody who is older and they're still acting like little kids and you're just going what is that i'm not talking about having fun and stuff i'm just talking about still acting like little kids throwing fits because they want they want what they want it's like okay that's really not very dignified is it and then he uses the word sensible we talked about that that has the idea of you you make good sense with your decisions you approach things in such a way that it's going to be helpful, sensible, sound in the faith. That idea of sound has to do with being healthy. You have a healthy respect and a healthy idea of what the faith is talking about, what it's teaching. Sound not only in the faith, but sound in love as well. You know what it looks like to love your brothers and sisters and it not be anything sensual at all. Do I need to talk about that very much in here? I hope not. He's talking to older guys right here. I'm going to step in it anyway. How you hug your sisters in Christ matters. How you treat them, how you talk to them, how you reach out to them, it matters. And you need to be sound in love, not just in what you say, but in your actions as well. It ought to be a different world inside the body of Christ than it is out there in the world, shouldn't it? And the way we treat our sisters in Christ and the way we treat women in general should be different. Amen, brothers? Not only that, sound in love, but also sound in perseverance. You can go through some things at your older age that you might not have been able to go through very well in your younger age. Yes? Because you've already proven God to be faithful over and over and over again in your life. So you know he's going to be there and he's going to be faithful. We can go through some things that we might not have been able to go through earlier. He talks about the older women. In verses 3 through 5, he says you need to be reverent. You need to watch your talk. Not as malicious gossips. You need to be careful with your tongue. You need to be careful with wine, not given to much wine. You need to make sure you're teaching what is good. You need to be a great example to the younger ladies. Why? Because they're watching. They are. They're looking at more than just the jewelry you wear or the hairstyle you have, or the clothing you have on, they're looking at the things that are a whole lot deeper. And that's particularly true for Christian young ladies who are trying to live the Christian life. So how'd you do that? How'd you raise your kids? How did you treat your husband? How did things look in your home? And they're looking for great examples. Be that example for them. Help them grow in that, which is going to require of you to be a good example, right? You're going to have to treat your husbands well. You're going to have to make sure that you do the things well also. The younger men, make sure that you know how to live the good life with them in front of all of them. Yes, be sure. Slaves, all of those kinds of things as well that are part of that. Now, grace teaches... And grace trains. Let me just go through a couple of these things. These are three of the words that are used right here in the training process. Okay? And it actually has the idea of giving us the fundamentals for all of that. Let me give you three things as we kind of close here today in thinking about this grace training that comes alive. He says, let me tell you about this 
training and grace. First of all, grace trains my impulses. It teaches me how to live this good life. It teaches me how to live here, and it also is affected by the hereafter. Okay? Our promised reward even rewards our world today because what happens is I will obey today based on where I'm going tomorrow. I know what's reserved for me, and I know, I know the value of it, and so I will live a different kind of life today so that I can inherit that life tomorrow. Man, I'm looking forward to that, aren't we all? I'm looking forward to having that, but that also requires of us a different kind of life. It trains my impulses. It keeps me from doing things that I might naturally do. It also trains my identity. In chapter 2 and verse 14, he will talk about you are the ones who are redeemed. You've had the price paid for you. You've been purified. You've been made holy. You are his own possession. You are no longer your own. You are his. You belong to him. When you wear the, the name Christ, a Christian, one who is like the Christ, that is not just a nice name. That's who you are. That's your identity. And eager, that identity flows into this idea of what you will do. Who you are makes a difference in how you behave. And so zealous, ardent, eager for good works as well. And finally, grace trains my intentions as well doesn't it because of what God has paid for me and because of what God has done in my life I want to live better for him don't you I want to I want to be better Paul says I've done all that other junk before it's not satisfying I've lived that kind of life before it didn't it didn't deliver on what was promised I want the Spirit to help me. Chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. I want the Spirit's work in my life. I want to see that t continue to take place. And I long for that transformation. Chapter 3, verse 3. I know what I used to do. I don't want to live there anymore. And Paul says that was true for him. That's hard for us to even to imagine Paul living that kind of life before, isn't it? I don't know what it was like for Timothy as he was growing up. He had a Greek father. It might have been a difficult life for him early on in trying to decide between Christianity and the Greek culture. But verse 4 tells us that it's the kindness of God that's appeared to us, and so it changes everything. Well, so how do we end up with all of this? What do we do now? Paul, did you leave us any clues? You know, with all of the different pictures of everything with Sherlock Holmes up here with his spyglass and looking at the prints and things. Did you leave us any clues about how we're to live? I think he left us a couple that are really, really important in this text. He says, make sure you are very active in your speaking, Titus. I think the same thing would be true for us today. Have we become silent Christians? Have we become more like Nicodemus who's scared to come to Jesus except under the cover of darkness? Afraid that somebody might see us, afraid that somebody might hear us, afraid that somebody might know that we really are Christians. That didn't sound like the first century very much, did it? Even under the threat of persecution, they went around living the kind of life. And that active speaking to communicate the gospel well, the teaching these things in verses in verse 1 of chapter 2, in verse 15 of chapter 2, and in verse 8 of chapter 3, all have to do with speaking. We said before that some things are taught and some things are caught, but some things are only caught if they're taught. Did, did you catch that? Life, sometimes are, there are examples that we catch what's being lived in front of us, yes? There are some things, though, that have to be taught. We've got to speak them for people to hear it. 
They're not going to learn everything they need to know simply by watching us live a good life. They may just think you're a good person. Well, let me tell you, I'm not that good. She knows. But God is. And he changes my intentions to be lots better. Some things are going to be caught, but many more things have to be taught. We've got to open our mouths. And then the second part is the accurate living. The training comes with learning how to do things well. So what is grace training you to do and training you to be? So I think God is more than happy to share with us in Scripture what the godly person really is doing, don't you? And it really isn't that much of a secret. Let's pray. Father, who you are simply amazes us that you would be so good to us and continually place in front of us Scripture and, and give to us passages out of your Bible that just astound us. This one is one of those that calls us higher, calls us to live better, calls us to live differently than the world around us. Help us, Father, to be that kind of person always. We are grateful for your grace. We don't want to take advantage of that, but, Father, we need it so much. And would you help us to live that kind of life, the godly life, and let it not be a secret that we're yours. In Jesus we pray. Kevin, thank you very much for that fine lesson. And we want you to know that we truly, truly miss you. We really do. Okay, we have a few on our prayer list. Johnny Evans is having a medical test this coming week. Kirby Huffman is going through uh, cancer treatments. Manny Harmingo uh, got stents this week. And Charlie Bobbitt's uh, grandson, Tyler, and his wife are having a complicated pregnancy. Rihanna Gordon had a mini stroke last week and is not doing very well. Then we need to remember Ronnie and Virginia Doolin and their health issues. Cheryl Black is dealing with cancer. Wendell and Ernestine Hughes have been married 70 years, so that's uh, a great achievement. I got a long way to go. <laughs> uh, pray for the Muslims, the uh, lost people of Islam. Uh, Stephan Stephanie Watson for safe travels. Dorothy Dunn for our sins. Ten. Brumfield is in Angola. It's his first visit and he's under difficult circumstances. Phyllis Cox is in hospice. And Carla Matthews is going to have surgery on Thursday. Jim, would you come and lead our prayer? And let's don't forget to stack the chairs. Pray with me. Father God, thank you for uh, the blessings that you surround us with every day. Just the blessing of life, the blessing of health to be here, Father, and the, the blessing of knowing that we are your possession, knowing that we are your children and that we are heirs to the kingdom. Father, we're thankful that uh, Kevin could be here to share your word with us 
uh, again this morning. We're thankful that he could be here to help celebrate the graduation of this class of SIBI. And for each of those graduates, Father, we pray your blessings on them uh, for wisdom and discernment to pick those areas of ministry where they can be most effective in your kingdom work. Uh, Father, we know there are many of our brothers and sisters that are are hurting. Uh, many have lost loved ones and are grieving over their loss, and we pray for their comfort and for the peace that only you can bring. And there are many, Father, that have been mentioned that are facing surgery. Many are <coughs> recovering from surgery. Many are facing a medical test that brings the uncertainty of, uh, of that. And we, there are many that are traveling. Uh, there are many that are facing ongoing treatment of long-term long illnesses such as cancer. And we pray your blessing and peace on them. And Father, as we, um, we go through this week ahead, we know that we face a, an uncertain world that seems to be coming more chaotic every day. And we thank you that we can always look to you as our anchor and as our rock and as our fortress. And you're always there and listening and just help us have the faith and the trust to always turn to you. Bless us, Father, in the, in the week to come. And um, as we're filled with uh, your indwelling spirit, help us to uh, be molded more each day into the image of Christ that we can share the good news of salvation uh, with a lost world. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>